be a formal book launch of the week, but this is the release of the book today. Uh, I got a call a week or two ago from someone in the press gallery asking me if I was doing an election year book this year. And I'm not, and I wasn't, but I was itching to say that I had been working for five years on the book that's here today, which in my view is more important than something just to cause a stir before an election or to get a little headline. It's taken me a, a huge amount of work, but it's covered an area which I think has been um, waiting to be cracked, that the defence forces and the intelligence services and foreign affairs have been involved in a very important part of New Zealand history and world politics for the last 10 years and have kept much more secret than they should have had the public had a right to know. It's been a long, hard and serious project and I hope it's going to have very, it's going to have um, value for years to come. And I see the book as having two purposes before I ask, answer your questions on. The first one is that this is the longest war, foreign war in New Zealand's history. And yet, as you all know, the Defence Force and the other agencies have mainly released regular kind of candy floss coverage but completely hidden everything that they thought looked, looked bad, or was controversial, or didn't suit them for their, their own agendas. And the public has a right to know about the whole war. The second thing, which reason for this book, is that actually outside the military and the intelligence services, very few people in New Zealand understand what goes on there. There's only the fuzziest, blurriest understanding of what they do. And so my objective with this, when I had gradually built up all the materials I got was to write something so that anybody who wanted to understand how New Zealand military things work, the history of them, what goes on inside the Navy, what actually the SAS does and how it works, what's going on inside the intelligence services, anyone who wants to know that can read this book and they will know more than any defence minister probably in the last 50 years has known about these subjects because I had the luxury of working on it for so long. As I say, it's hard to work on, and I could never have done it without the assistance of a large number of people inside the system. I can't obviously explain who the sources were, but in the preface, I have detailed roughly what sorts of people have helped me and what numbers. And this was senior defence and military people, it was intelligence officers, it was government officials, many people working around the beehive and so on. And not only did they give me interviews, but they allowed me to have a large amount of documentation. Anyone who reads through this will see that this is of necessity, because there was no other way to write it. By far the largest leak of military and intelligence documents in the history of New Zealand. And for a 10 year war, there would have been no other way to write it. But that, that's but the point of the leak was not the leak, it was that there was this huge, important story about New Zealand, which most of most New Zealanders knew almost nothing about. I'll just give you a brief outline of what's in the book and I'll answer the questions. For those of you who obviously haven't, haven't had a chance to see it yet, sorry. The book goes through a series of stages. The first chapter sets the scene as saying what happened on September 11 New Zealand time, which is the day before their time. The United States. It's saying what our Navy was doing, what the Air Force was doing on that day, what was going on in front of the Fed's house. Basically, introducing to, to ordinary New Zealanders, which is practically everyone, what exactly goes on in our Fed's Force. And then the early chapters are looking at the, the attacks near exactly 10 years ago today in Washington and New York, and the reaction inside the White House, but then the bit that we've never heard about, that's the reaction that went on inside New Zealand and um, the discussions that went on in New Zealand to react uh, early on what, was, what they were saying inside the SAS about what they thought was happening inside Afghanistan, the SAS preparations, the exercises they held, they, um, they're working their way towards arriving there in early December, just a few, uh, 2001, just a few weeks really after the first attacks. I then told a story about the SAS in Afghanistan, there's many chapters on that, of different stages of their time in Afghanistan. I told about the Peacekeepers who were sent to Kabul, who weren't peacekeepers at all. It's one of the first signs of the Defence Force ignoring the specific directions of the government about what they did. And while there were 
uh, while there were ministers back in New Zealand talking about how they were helping rebuild that poor war-torn country and had peacekeepers on the ground, helping people in Afghanistan. In fact, the peacekeepers were working in Oman and Pakistan, loading CIA helicopters and helping load explosives for British paratroopers. And they weren't doing peacekeeping at all. And so it rolled on. There are lots of instances of that because there was a tension that went on between the Defence Force and its agendas and what it would do in the war, and the government. And the way that they dealt with that contradiction, which was a reasonably reluctant Labour government at that time, and a gung-ho Defence Force that wanted to improve its relations with the United States, was they just kept things secret and they misled the ministers. And this might sound like a, a, it's, um, an unlikely or, or a, a wild thing to say, except that you can read the individual documents all the way through, which is why I say it could this book not have been written without the so much assistance from inside which I received. Then the book moves on through the Navy and the Air Force. It goes through what we did in Iraq, the good side of New Zealand's reaction to Iraq, and then the, the not so good sides when foreign affairs persuaded the government to try to get involved in post-invasion Iraq. And then it moves on to Bamiyan, which is the most well-known part of New Zealand's contribution in Afghanistan. But it's a funny kind of awareness, because what's been written about Bamiyan has largely been true except it's, it's kind of um, been a very partial picture. So what people have been told has been true, but if you read the chapters on Bamiyan, you'll find that most of what went on there, a lot of what, what went on there, had been airbrushed brushed out of the picture that was being given to reporters and to the, the New Zealand news media through the defence communications people. There's also, a while ago, this is just one detail, a while ago I got asked on the Official Information Act for the government's reviews of how they'd gone in Bamiyan. This was after National came in. And I got this official information uh, bundle back, which had this big report about how, how the def Defence Force had done in Bamiyan. And they kept being these big chunks out of it, with 6A written on it, meaning the Security, Defence, and International Relations of New Zealand. And so one of the things I wanted to do before the book was finished was to try to get a clean copy of that report. And it came walking along my veranda one night, just after I finished the book and when it was in the editing processes. And I inserted it at the last minute, and I put in what all those six A bits were, which were supposedly threatening the defence and security of New Zealand, to be told what had happened in Bamiyan. And what the report was actually saying was that most of what they had been doing there had been poorly planned, and successful, was falling apart, the security was not what it seemed. In other words, that year after year of rosy PR stories had been hiding something which was blatantly obvious to the officials and the military people involved, because this was a big report based on interviewing all those people. In other words, the public has just been kind of spun from beginning to end. And they've got the right to know. And finally, there are chapters about the intelligence operations, which very few people know about. And this is about, this is the bloodiest part of New Zealand involvement in the war, which is tremendously important and is almost completely absent from any accounts to date of what's going on there. And that is that far more people died, not because we had SAS people there, but that we were lending our most qualified intelligence people, like from the, about two weeks after September 11, we had intelligence people who were in analyzing U2, that's those high-flying spy satellite planes, who were analyzing their information sitting in Florida, helping the targeting. And right through to now, and increased under the national government, we've had people who have been helping in the midst of the American intelligence machine, gathering the information on Afghanistan that's used for targeting. And then finally, the, at the end of the book, I've interviewed, this is the bit which I was most pleased to get, actually, I interviewed a series of very senior people, diplomats, high foreign affairs officials, people around the, the, the high level of the government, and I said to them, how could this happen? How could it, how could it come about that, you know, Alan Clark and jo John Key and that lot, we said that they were going to have an independent foreign policy and said the things they did in public. How come we were loading CIA helicopters with peacekeepers? How come we were covering up this and doing that and all the things people weren't told? And that's when they gave me their intern, they gave me their view of the inside workings of what had gone on in the war on terror. And I, I think that I hope a lot of officials are going to read that and be sobered by what their colleagues are saying about the way that foreign, that foreign affairs and defence work. Um, <coughs> I 
I know that when a book comes out like this, most of you will have a chance to only flick through it. And so, can I say, I promise you, in days or weeks ahead, if you want to, if you read into this book, you're going to find riches there which cannot be found on the first day. Even in the footnotes, which I'm afraid they didn't have time to index, um, there are riches of stuff. So I, I had, as I say, thousands and thousands of military and intelligence documents that went into this book. And so for those who are interested, don't assume it's been stripped on the first day. And if you want to get hold of me tomorrow or the next day or next week and ask me for things that you might follow up, I'll be happy to because I've been working on this for five years and I'm keeping the information gets out. Thank you. Any questions? Um, yeah. The disconnect between what was happening on the ground in Jay Oman and Pakistan versus the PR, how many people, how widespread was that knowledge? The part of people who were actually there, who else knew about the fulfillment? I'll just, I'll give you an example. So we had these peacekeepers in the defense. The ministers were putting their names on press releases which said our people are on the ground helping the poor people of Kabul get back on their feet after what's happened. I've got, in the, book, in the book, I quote copies of the reports which the um, airloaders were sending home and their post-deployment reports where they talked about what they were doing on the ground. Those reports would have been read by their, their superiors. They would have been read by, I hope they would have been read by the head of the Joint, joint Forces out in Trentham. I suspect that no one beyond that ever knew that they decided, let's just close it down. And in fact, in that case, the senior officer in charge of those people even knew that they were bluffing because as I put in the book, he actually writes in the media section of his final report, don't worry, I briefed my staff to blur everything that they were doing on these things into the official duties. So they knew exactly what was going on there. But I would say hardly anyone knew. In that case, uh, the, the head of the Joint Forces New Zealand visited Early, quite early on, those peacekeepers, and I quote his report writing back saying that he is feeling uncomfortable about the blurring of roles that's going on, and this is very bad in a UN mandated joint uh, operation, and, and then nothing happens. Because actually, after he visited, it became even more of that, because I've got the detail, I've got the statistics of the planes they were loading and the things they were doing. So people, the senior military people knew, but they basically seemed to have covered it up. But the people on the ground there who were rank and file army units, right? <coughs> that, that they were uh, under the same kind of strict operational uh, secrecy that the SAS did after that. Yeah, but that, the military people are to told to keep everything secret that, that they do. I wouldn't blame those people who were, who were supposed to be working in Kabul. They would have been your typical New Zealand, good sorts who were keen to go to another country, help the local people. I actually quote one of them before she leaves, one of the ones who was loading military aircraft with explosives, saying how she's looking forward to helping the people of Kabul when she gets there and so on. That's an ordinary decent Kiwi, but the reality is that every deployment of New Zealanders who went to <coughs> Afghanistan or to Iraq, from the day they arrived, they moved completely under the control of their American and British commanders. And they obeyed orders, which is what they were told to do. And that's what happens. Should, should we be surprised that um, CIA officers, why should we be surprised that CIA officers are based in Barmia and are based in what, it's an American-led war, of course CIA officers will be on our base. Well, first thing I'll quickly say, what I say in the book is that there are these people who work in Barmia in civilian clothing, carrying guns, I've got photogra various photographs I've been given of them, one in the book, I've got other photographs as well if anyone's interested. Um, <coughs> who debrief the New Zealanders when they come back from their missions, who have act like they run the base and who no one seems to have any control over, and they're not part of the military command. They're part of this weird arrangement in Afghanistan where there were two commands. There was the CIA war and there was the American war. I think if you were to say to most New Zealanders, do you think that all the PR you've been told about, the New Zealand Kiwi base and the friendly Kiwi people going around meeting locals and doing their work, that part of that picture would have included that they were guarding the CIA base, which has a very different agenda from the New Zealand peacekeeping one, I think most people would be very surprised. If you told them that there were other Americans in there running a secret intelligence base, and that we, they were running American organized psychological operations out of there, and so on, that actually it was much more an American base than anyone was told, New Zealanders would be really shocked and surprised because there's been such an effort to tell them something else. Do you, do you think we should have had a, a, a policy where CIA weren't allowed on the New Zealand base? Oh, I think 
that if they hadn't thought they would keep it se could keep it secret, they would never have had CI on the New Zealand base because while the local people and probably local insurgents will be very aware of Americans without uniforms who drive around the countryside and so on, they'll know they'll know there. But um, I, I think if the New Zealand military and government had known that that would become public, they would have realised that that does not fit with running something called a provincial reconstruction team. And in the other countries, your mother remember, there was that CIA assassination where the suicide bomber went into the um, base on the Pakistan border and blew up some CIA people. It happened about a year or so ago. That was a PRT base. They were supposed to be handing out aid and things. And there was a huge debate around the world about why have you got CIA operations inside something which is supposed to be rebuilding a poor country and putting it back on its feet. Just Same on, issues here. On the CIA, are you saying that, um, I mean, obviously the public didn't know, but were the ministers <coughs> not told about that as well? Do you know what? I don't know, because no. And please, please remember, what I say in the book is, it looks like they're CIA, all I know is that they're non-uniform intelligence officers. But when I, I should explain, when I, when I, when I, when I, when I've been told about these officers by a series of people on different deployments, I went into the Wiki WikiLeaks database and I looked up OGA, which stands for Other Government Agency, uh, what they call the CIA and the WikiLeaks papers. This is the Afghanistan WikiLeaks papers, not the State Department papers. And I found all the references to OGA all the way through there. There were stacks of them. And what I found is that there were OGA chiefs of state, and OGA deputy chiefs, and OGA other people and OGA campaigns of different sorts running out of all the American bases, including PRTs in that part of the country. And so it's a pretty, it's, it's, it's very likely that we were just part of the system, but I'm not sure that we are. Mm -hmm. so that's a nice question, though, what we're saying. No, well, it was, uh, I mean, it leads on to my other one, which is generally, are you suggesting that, um, that ministers were kept in the dark because you don't have proof that they were told, or were you told by defence and foreign affairs people that they kept the politicians in the dark? What I was told was, I was told in general terms, that politicians were kept in the dark about large number of things, and I've, you'll see in there in certain instances where the government was saying one thing in public and doing another. We'd like the, the CIA plans. I very much doubt that the government was told that. But I have to say, I was told in generalities that the government wasn't being told. I wasn't told spe for specific sites, the, those intelligence officers in Bahrain. I just don't know. So, so do you have documents that say the CIA were on Kiwi base, or is that sort of...? No, no, I'm saying, I've got eyewitnesses there, I've got photographs of them saying there's these guys who sort around, who debrief us when we come back from our patrols, and we're never told why it is that we're reporting to these non-uniformed Americans with their dark glasses when we arrive back from a New Zealand patrol. And they have their own secret part of the base, and the boss of them is involved in all the, all the weekly meetings with, with our boss, coordinating what happens at the base, but we don't know what they're doing there. So that's what I knew, gave me photographs to prove they were there, and as I say, I do know, I look through the WikiLeaks stuff and discover that all these other bases around us, which are similar US-run ones, in that eastern sector of Afghanistan, which is the one which the Americans run, which we're part of, there seem to be the OGA chief and the OGA deputy chief and the OGA operations and the OGA psychological operations base by base, which means it's a pretty good guess that they are CIA, but I'm not claiming it because I don't know. At, at the Bamiyan base, when doing the speak there, I know when I went there myself, um, they were fairly open that they were American intelligence people. Especially who's who they were those guys? They said they were American intelligence. Well, depends which ones so, they're talking about. So, so, and I've spoken to several other journalists who, who went to the Bamiyan camp and had similar experience. We met a New Zealand SIS people in Kabul, and America had an intelligence officers in the Bamiyan camp. So, I don't well, you, I'll talk you say they, 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 they went to get ready to keep it secret, but they were, they were pretty open about it. Why has nobody ever written it? Because, I suppose, because it's probably not that surprising that you have intelligence people in the world. Well, let me, let, let me, my answer to that would be, there are two types of intelligence officers. The ones who were seen most and talked about the most were the signals intelligence people who were there, which has also never been written about, which is that there's a signals intelligence unit in the part of the base which I have been persuaded legally that I shouldn't say what it is, where they run a separate unit there where they spy on the region and they're Americans there working at it. But um, the existence of a, a completely separate 
non-New Zealand, not under New Zealand control, not even under US military control, CIA operation of some sort, apparently, inside the friendly old Kiwi base is not the impression that New Zealand is forgiven at all. Mm, I, guess, I guess a lot of people would argue, I'm not saying that, you know, I mean, people are doing it to write about it, and it's interesting, mm. but I guess, you know, it's probably not that surprising that you would have intelligence people and intelligence operations in an extremely dangerous part of, um, of the world, because you want to know what's going on. So it's not really yeah. surprising that you have intelligence operations in a base like that. It's not surprising except, I, I know, once I was told about it, it had the ring of truth. However, the picture which has been given to New Zealand was of Bamiyan being this island of peace and very Kiwi difference, which was, a, was away from all the nastiness of the war. Yeah, and that's from, not, that's just just not really true. New Zealanders have been um, blown up and killed, so... Obviously, it's part of the wars. I don't know if anyone believed it was some sort of oasis of calm. Well, it was. No, for many years there, it was regarded that way, and we still had the CIA operating there and the rest of it. There's all those intelligence officers working there and the rest of it. Did you go to Afghanistan in the preparation of the book? No, I did not. No. Do you think that that would have been necessary to get a, a really good view? Um, as you'll see, I've, I've worked off documents and interviews, and, oh, well, you can, you can judge the product. I'm happy with it. Don't you think, Nikki, that actually your beef is really with um, the confusion, the identity crisis that's happened for Defence Forces delivering aid and doing aid, what is essentially aid for, and therefore being somehow outraged that um, that they are mixing with, with intelligence, but mil military intelligence officers just normal for any soldier, and that the, the real um, demarcation line here that's been crossed is that provincial reconstruction teams are actually doing aid work and that has compromised perhaps aid workers and their own, you know, it's, it's caused that kind of confusion about what are they doing there? Are they aid workers or are they soldiers? And a lot of public, the public would say well, they don't find it unusual or surprising that as soldiers they would have military op um, uh, intelligence op operational people among them. There's a few issues mixed up there. Yes, there have been tremendous issues to do with the mixing of aid, which have been talked about before now. Mixing of aid in with, the, with trying to run the pre provincial reconstruction team, which was essentially a security operation. And as I said, this report I got recently was talking about just how poor the aid had been, that it had been unsuccessful, that the, the attempt to get military people on six-month rotations, starting from scratch each time to redevelop an area, just didn't work. There's that side of it. There's another side of it which is that New Zealand has its own military intelligence people attached to its base. Of course it does. That's the way that that's the way a military works. The, the thing which I thought was interesting about Bamiyan is simply that there were so many components of it, which when we were told it was a Kiwi operation, were actually showing what maybe some of you know, but which is certainly not what the public understands, which is that it's just another US base with some New Zealanders doing some of the functions of it. And maybe you know that, but that's not what the public was led to believe. Nikki, the um, New Zealand uh, Defence Force Intelligence Officers involved with um, setting targets for drones in Pakistan. What evidence, uh, what, where were they based? Did you say Florida? Bagram. At Bagram, sorry. And the, the, what happened was very early in the war, there were intelligence officers put into the Tampa, Florida, Florida yeah. to, to <coughs> lend, lend extra hands there. And then in April, May of the following year, 2002, the Americans were pulling their intelligence officers out of Afghanistan as they put the focus on Iraq. And we started supplying, first of all, military ones, and then military and GCSB staff into the headquarters and background. And, and then under the national government, it's again. Is there documentary evidence of that amongst the, the documents that you've got? Extensive. And what were, what, were they, what were they doing with, when they were in the background? Were they, they were working mostly in the signals intelligence unit of the larger intelligence base, a larger intelligence centre, which was attached to the operations centre where they, where they directed their, their aircraft and so on. And so they did, were in that combat. Did they, direct, did, did they direct drones into Pakistan? Our officers weren't doing the stuff like this because that happens from, from Nevada or wherever it is, but they were helping to, to produce the targeting lists, yes. That's what their job was. They were, they, they were working on electronic maps 
noting where they'd got hits, putting them on there, and sending the information through to the people who were directing the bombers. So yeah. you have documentary evidence that New Zealand officers were setting targets in Pakistan, helping set targets in Pakistan. In, in the sake of Pakistan, Pakistan's a particularly controversial one because the offer that was called um, Operation Kiwi Cracker, and I've got the Chief of Defence Force directions for what they do, and I've got the cabinet paper which directs what they do, and it said that they're allowed to go there and help operations within Afghanistan. And then you may remember that a, a book came out in the US last year which got pulped. Does this ring a bell? A military intelligence book on Afghanistan, briefly on TVNZ, but no one actually had the detail of what was in it. And I got hold of that book, and one of the stories in that book is the New Zealand intelligence officer, and the deleted parts which no one's seen, is a New Zealand intelligence officer who was running, was actually collecting intelligence and building up a picture of what was happening to target Taliban insurgents inside Afghanistan, inside Pakistan, which was, seems to be specifically breaking the instructions that had come from the Chief of Defence Force and the government for what we'd be doing there. So, did that knowledge flow back to the chain of command? Don't know. How many of your sources have um, put themselves at legal risk by leaving this type of All of them. Hmm. Are of any of, so, some of them are still working at defence? Yeah. Uh, what, what is motivating them, do you think? As with all of my projects, um, I, I, over a large period of time, I found people, I approached them, I asked them if they would talk to me. And, um, I, as you know, you've seen my previous books, I never cease to be amazed how people, when they're asked to back up what they say, turn up with documentation. And, I, and it was very varied. It was, sometimes it was small amounts and sometimes it was tremendously huge amounts. But, um, I had a mood, I had various moods inside the fence. There was, for example, in dealing with SAS people, there was a, there's a lot of disquiet inside the SAS on various things about these deployments, which has all been kept, well, apart from John Stevens' work, has mostly been kept below the surface. Um, inside the Defence Force itself, there's a lot of um, discomfort about what happened around the Iraq War. There's, there's, there's also, you'll see as one of the subplots of the book, there's a lot of discomfort about the internal, um, sort of internal political wars within defence. Some of the people who helped me have been in different factions of the internal political wars within defence. And, and there's a policy war. So this was about whether or not we were going to support the Labour government's attempt to restructure defence to be more independent, more army focused and things. And that caused not much seen in public, but deep unhappiness at all different levels within the defence headquarters. So that a lot of turbulence and a lot of debate has been going on, which hasn't mostly been reaching the surface. But these were people who, when I approached them, were quite motivated to help. What, what was your impression of the role Security McBride played in all of this? That is a very interesting question. Now, Jerry doesn't write down very much. He didn't when he was in that role. And in fact, in general, the kind of, the kind of um, chain of evidence that you would want to say that someone's specifically responsible for a particular thing, I couldn't get. So I don't know. But Jerry McBride was in the midst of most of the most controversial things that happened, first as the Chief of the Army, and then as the Chief of Defence Force. And in terms of strict culpability for anything which was dodgy, hidden, or where the ministers were misled, he was, up, he was up there as involved as anybody else was, of a tiny handful of people who should have known. So are you suggesting there that he would have known information no, that was I would say from he those. should have known, but, uh, but actually when you're looking at a huge bureaucracy you can't, and you don't have all, and, and I'm not omnipotent, I can't actually say exactly what Jerry Mathbride knew. So in fact, in the book, I don't go hard on him because I actually didn't have the evidence, but he sits there throughout as the top person over the army person, part, and then the top person over the, the, the defence force and so he obviously still has many questions to answer as he, you know, avoids the press. Do you think he's a suitable government general? I, my personal opinion, for what it's worth, is that if the government had known what was going to come out about the SAS a bit earlier, or if they'd known about this, he probably wouldn't be the government general now. But once they had done it, their pride and they're not wanting to suggest they've done something wrong meant they just pushed ahead with it. No, that's, 
without answering those questions and without clearing that stuff, because this is very, these are very important issues about international law and the Geneva Conventions and so on, he should have either fronted it and cleared it and then taken the job or he should have stepped down. But I think there was a kind of bloody-mindedness that they didn't want to admit that they made the wrong decision. I hear that they're uncomfortable about that inside, but they didn't want to back down. You write um, about the SAS on, on page 69 that they're in a, um, a confrontation and people are shooting at them. And then you write, why did they not take a hint and back off after the first shots and perhaps return in daylight to meet and talk to people? Yeah. People, a lot of people read that and think that's a, a little bit optimistic in terms of what might be realistic. Um, if you're getting fired on at night, um, that, that you return the next day to talk to them instead of, instead of firing back. What, what would be your response to that? How would we respond to that? Because there's actually a very important issue in that. And that is that from here, it would sound reasonable like, like this is a normal war, like there's our side and then there's the enemy, so of course you don't go back the next day to talk to the enemy, but actually, Pakistan is not, I mean, sorry, Afghanistan is not two sides of a war. It's this incredibly complicated <coughs> situation of tribes and warlords and smugglers and small time criminals and you never know who's shooting to you and as I pointed out that that relatively early stage of the war that probably wasn't you know organized Taliban insurgents or something who they meet in the dark when they're just driving through a piece of country that they don't know about that they're sussing out as part of their patrolling and so chances are there was some unlovely warlord or some rel equally unlovely smugglers who were involved in that, who shoot at people who come towards them in the dark. But that's very different from it being the other side of the war, because it, when, in daylight, they were meeting lots of people like that, and they weren't fighting with them. It was a complicated war to put yourself in the middle of like that and just start shooting. That was the point of that. Um, are you personally opposed to New Zealand and Afghanistan? Am I? Are you personally opposed to New Zealand and Afghanistan? Yeah, I'm, I think that it is that if you were to try to, to, to uh, look at it objectively and say, what has this got to do with New Zealand's interests? And why, what, what exactly is this civil war? And who is our enemy there? I would say there hasn't been a coherent idea, even of who the enemy is and what our objectives are, from the very beginning of that war, and it's only got worse. And I wouldn't say this is only my opinion. Very early in the war, like very early, the chief of the, of the Joint Forces New Zealand, Martin <coughs> Dunn, flew to visit the SAS in Kandahar where their base was. And this was before the New Zealanders even knew that they were in Kandahar or there'd be any information on them. And he wrote a report about them. He said they've got very poor conditions, they've set up showers, they haven't been on many missions yet, they seem to be just sitting around doing nothing. He said those things. But then he said, but the most alarming thing I've found is it doesn't seem to be any coherent strategy to what doing here or what's going on. I really reckon, this is in chapter 3 I think, I really recommend you read it because this is right back at the start, this is the most senior military officer saying basically, what's this about? Who's the enemy and what's going on here? And, any, and, what, and this is why this book is, hasn't been written as a kind of a, a shock horror press release. When you watch the, hear these people's voices right from the start and you hear about the battles they're in and you look at the stages of it, this picture emerges of this tragedy where we've just been completely in the wrong place with no, no good reason to be there right from the beginning, tangled up in something which actually should never have started. The Americans should have never gone there. It's pretty apparent now. And, um, and all that kept us there, you see it in document after document, was that the Defence Forces were seeing this as a great way to get new training for their C-130 Hercules at this place in the States or to get closer training ties with those people there or to improve their intelligence ties. It was seen as a political opportunity rather than as a war, as any ordinary person would think was a reason for going to war. But the government could argue that it was UN mandated and it's hard to be with world citizens to do that, isn't it? Well, somebody thinks that should read the book and they will come out with a very different view of the complication of that kind of situation. So were you surprised that someone like Alan Clark, who was a control freak, deeply suspicious of officials, kind of allowed herself to be kept in the dark over these things? This is, one, this is another interesting subplot. <coughs> I think there'll be some people who will read this and say, buddy Helen Clark, it's pretty apparent from the years that she was there that she was the only minister who was really engaged in these issues. And this is what the officials were saying to me. And they spoke to her 
more kindly, more kindly about her role than I would have initially assumed. And, they would, and you could see the quotes on it in the book. They were saying that at every meeting, she was the one who was asking questions and trying to get behind what they were saying and trying to micromanage, as you say. And I read your quote off the back. Um, this is a very senior person who said to me, people assume that politicians make decisions, but often they're busy, ill-informed, or actively excluded. The worst decisions were made by senior officials and military officers, often without the minister's knowledge. And what I'd say is, you see, in the, by this, these riches of documents that I've got, you can actually see the conversations and the cases where Helen Clark is giving instructions and going back and trying to rewrite things and then going back again because she's still not feeling comfortable with what she's been given. But in the end, there's another person who said, the whole, as I said, the whole last chapter is interviewing senior, senior officials on these exact issues. And second to last chapter. Um, and, and what they're saying is that in the end, one person isolated in her shoes was not up to it. And she just wasn't there enough at the time and knowing enough to stop them getting their way on lots of things, was the, was the view that was put to me. Did you withhold anything in the interests of New Zealand or security? Yes, I, that's a good question. I, I got leaked, as I say, thousands of intelligence and military documents of different sorts. A very large number of them I didn't use to protect sources because I didn't want to triangulate on, my, on the people who gave it to me. So I left out, reluctantly, large chunks of material which because of the dates or the specific areas would have made it too easy to hurt someone who's helping me. But also, you know, I went through this process of thinking, I don't want people to say that I endangered the truth. And so, first of all, when I wrote it, I was leaving out stuff, and then I actually did another run through when it, the book was nearly finished, and I cut out a lot of detail, for example, of SAS equipment. I had all the equipment lists of what they went to Afghanistan with, and I just cut it. And I thought, well, no, fair enough, I won't put that in. And I also cut a lot of names out. So although there's senior people's names, and there's a lot of incidental names, email from this person to this person in my footnotes to justify things, um, there's very few junior people. I cut the junior people's names out. I cut out people where I thought they might be in an operational situation. In other words, I, I trimmed and trimmed and trimmed because I really didn't want, didn't want to be accused of doing that. But in saying that, I mean, on page 300, you named um, two, two GCSB Oh, yep, um, because I don't think they're at any risk. I wrote a whole book on the GCSB with about 400 people, no, 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 but, but a few hundred people's names in. And the main criticism I got for that GCSB book is an interesting one, right? Do you know the book? I mean, Secret Power, my first book. I had lists of all the directors. I had lists of everyone who'd ever filled the major roles. I mentioned everyone who'd been on overseas posting. I was doing it really thoroughly. I hadn't left anyone out there. The only complaints I ever got was from people moaning to me that they didn't have their names in there. <laughs> now this is a true story because GCSB people are allowed to tell their own families what they do, and they're all taking the book home and showing them what they did and where they fit into the structure. So, 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 so what I'm saying is, so Graham, I think Hill, be, Graham Hill and Belinda James will be. They are not going to die out of this. When the, the military is quite happy to name Willie Appy Arthur and send them into some wrestling with suicide bombers in Kabul, God help us, you know. And so, when I'm naming people who are either working safely in New Zealand like everyone else who gets named in the newspaper for good and bad things, or when they're working in deep inside military bases, which we've got 75 rings of razor wire around them. No, it's just fine. I've made judgments which I think are perfectly fair. Yeah. Oh, just another question on an unrelated matter. Um, the identity of Mark Taylor, the New Zealander, um, under strict um, restrictions for his travel because he's on a ASIO um, and uh, U.S. Security Services watch list. Uh, uh, are you aware of, aware of that? You know what? I've had my head down, to be honest. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. Hey, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks very much.